Okay, so I guess we can start the event. Um, thank you all for being here. It's uh, my pleasure to start this wonderful event on climate diplomacy and negotiation, reuniting Terry Lynn Williams Davidson, BZ Gray, and Deborah McGregor. Thank you all for being here. And while we meet today on a virtual platform, I would first like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land and space, which we all call home. And I invite everyone to reflect on this point and the different identities, histories, and relations that are interwoven into their home landscape. And so I will now bring particular emphasis on Canada and uh, Great Britain. So my name is Victoria Manuel, and I am of settler descent, born and raised on the unceded territory of the Huron Wendat. And as we begin this event, we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of Canada. Canada is located on traditional and unceded lands of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And our speakers come from the traditional and unceded lands of the Haida Gwaii, from Amjanon First Nation, Treaty 29 Territory, and Whitefish River Nation. And I want to acknowledge that colonial violence continues to negatively impact Indigenous people. And I recognize that we are gathered virtually <laughs> in an institution, the University of Oxford, with a colonial history and a colonial present. And we aim here to continuously lessen ongoing colonial harm through speaking about them. And I make this statement as an affirmation of our commitment and my commitment here at, at ODA to improving our professions, practices, and to further reflect on our positionality. In light of our discussion today on climate actions and negotiations, I would like to bring to your attention the current advocacy effort of Haida Nation, Amjanon First Nations, and Whitefish River Nation. So thank you all for coming to this event. My name is Victoria Manuel Forest Brian, as I mentioned earlier on, and I will be moderating this event. And before stepping into the first part of our event, which is a moderated discussion, we have Professor Loha Hibal to provide a first introductory statement on behalf of the Oxford Department of International Development. She's an anthropology professor here at ODIT, focusing on climate change, sustainability, and development. She is also the initiator of the Climate Change and Development Lecture Series, which this event is taken part of. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Victoria. A warm welcome on behalf of the department to our speakers from the Anishinaabe and Haida Nations, our audience, and our future listeners of this very special event, because one important aspect of our uh, series is that we do want to curate those events so that they are not disappearing in the virtual thin, thin air, but people can come back, revisit them with new thoughts. Increasing realization of many of us um, of the multiple and intertwined crisis of the world that we currently experience and that causes so much human suffering has brought us to try to address with more responsibility the interface between climate change and development. We have become increasingly aware of how difficult it is to control our destinies in the face of environmental degradation, the changing climate, biocultural diversity loss, runaway technology, and black swan pandemics. They are quite difficult to separate in many ways. But in the light of all of this, we scholars who work in development studies, we must ask, how can we repurpose development? How can we restructure the political economy that is failing us? In this light, in May 2019, we started to draft a pledge. Although it is not official, the pledge is getting more and more support and it constitutes of five areas. One, each of us individually and collectively will work at achieving carbon neutrality by 2030. Two, we will revise our teaching programs so that they fully reflect the severity of the planetary threat posed by climate change and the costs and harms of environmental degradation. Three, we will make addressing the ecological crisis is a systemic part of our research. Four, we will actively participate in interdisciplinary projects that investigate the varied ways in which human flourishing and ecological thriving interlock and the nature of their mutual interdependency. Five, we will foster meaningful debates throughout the university and throughout our networks 
on models of economic development that respect difference, pluralism and democracy while promoting a common understanding of justice and responsibility. And it is very much for that five point that I see this webinar as an important initiative and we need to thank, thank Victoria for organizing it. The reason why the pledge is not yet official is what does it mean to have an official pledge? We keep changing our ideas. The more we learn, the more we understand what is happening to us, the more the words we've put on paper seem to be insufficient. And this is part of the, you know, of what we are trying to do with that series, I suppose. Let me share a few more thoughts with you before we open. In his famous 1949 essay, Why Socialism, Albert Einstein argued that human problems and questions affecting the organization of society should be addressed for public democratic debate rather than being left to professional economists and other experts. When society is passing through a crisis of such magnitude that its stability is gravely shattered, that was his words, it is the very relationship of the individual to society which must be rethought, including the role, shape, and functions of organizations capable of protecting us from danger. For the last 12 months, we have invited a wide range of speakers to contribute to our collective reflections on the dilemmas of collective action raised by the global climate change crisis. We are so delighted to have you sharing your thoughts with us today. Many thanks. Before I finish, I just want to apologize on the behalf of one of our Lever Young postdoc fellow who was supposed to uh, close um, the, the webinar, Dr. Natalia Buitron. She has been an important figure in the department to promote the um, indigenous studies program that we are trying to develop here in Oxford. And it is in this light as well that this webinar is very important for us. So thank you very much to all of you. I'm really excited about this webinar and I wish you a very, very good discussion. Thank you, Laura, so much for these insightful words. Um, uh, this week, you know, the word climate has been on everyone's lips, especially with the COP26. Um, the current environmental breakdown is having unprecedented, unprecedented uh, effects on our social and ecological systems, and profound change is needed. And during this talk, we will precisely, uh, we are precisely interested in the processes of negotiating climate actions and solutions a process that is without saying uh, enmeshed in power dynamics and inequalities. And discussions around climate solutions and problems are currently heavily dominated by Global North Agenda, which emphasizes, which tends to emphasize technological innovation, net zero approaches like as examples. And further reflection is needed on how to ensure indigenous people who represent much of the world's cultural human diversity be more effectively represented, valued, and incorporated in both domestic and international settings. So we are using the term here, diplomacy, to refer to what to that cross-cultural negotiation. How do different groups understand the environment, nature, justice, development, and how do these different understandings come and engage with each other? And how do these groups collaborate together? And so here to discuss this topic are three wonderful speakers uh, coming from different corners of Canada. We have Deborah McGregor joining us from Ontario. Professor Deborah McGregor is an associate professor and Canada research chair in Indigenous environmental justice at York University. Her research focuses on Indigenous knowledge and legal systems and their various applications in diverse contexts, including water and environmental governance, environmental and climate justice, health and environment and sustainability. So thank you, Deborah McGregor, for joining us today. It's a real pleasure. And we have Terry Lynn Williams Davidson, a citizen of and general counsel to the Haida Nation. She practices indigenous environmental law since 1995, and she is currently pursuing a master's of law. And since 1995, she has represented the Haida Nation at all levels of courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada and litigation to protect the old growth forests of Haida Gwaii the Haida case, which is the leading case on consultation and accommodation of indigenous rights. She is, she is also counsel for the Haida Nation's Aboriginal title case, 
as well as the related reconciliation negotiation, which have resulted in innovative agreements with British Columbia and Canada, as well as other litigation such as successfully challenging the Enbridge Northern Gateway project and injunctive relief for Herring. Terry Lynn is also an honorary director of Ecojustice and volunteer on the Law Society of British Columbia Truth and Reconciliation Advisory Committee and is the co-chair of the Indigenous Engagement and Regulatory Matters Task Force. She is an affiliate research scholar with Canada Climate Law Initiative. And throughout her work, she's received numerous awards for her lifetime contributions to Indigenous law, environmental protection, and sustainability. And on top of that, she's also a multi-award winning performer and an artist, dancer, and author. It is a pleasure to have you early this morning, Carolyn. Thank you so much. And finally, we have BZ Gray. Is a BZ Gray is a stu spirit, Anishinaabe Delaware Oneada from Anjanan First Nation Treaty, 9, Treaty 29 Territory. They are an organizer of grassroots events based on culture and environment through the group Anjanan and Sarnia Against Pipelines. Events like Toxic Tour and Anjanan Water Gathering, they focus on telling their experience of living in Canada's Chemical Valley. Thank you all for being here with us. And we will now proceed to the first part of our talk. It will be a moderated discussion of approximately 45 minutes, followed by a 25 minute Q&A. So I invite all of our audience members to write their questions in the chat in the Q&A box chat, and we will answer them at the Q&A section. So Tara Lynn, Deborah and Bizi, although I have some questions for you, you are welcome to chip in. And uh, this round table is meant to be a dialogue around climate negotiation, activism and diplomacy. So let's start. So, you know, as we've said, climate change is having an immense impact across the world and different regions in Canada are also being affected quite differently. And I'd like to start with you, Vizi. Last year, you wrote the foreword in Greenpeace's recycling report in Canada. You effectively denounced the environmental start, state of your hometown, dubbed in Canada, the Chemical Valley. For those unfamiliar with it, can you describe the space and how it has shaped your activism and who you are today. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to speak with such like amazing, powerful people. Um, yeah, so um, it's funny to talk without pictures because I feel like pictures is a thing that like drives stuff home, but to describe it in words, I'm like, Amjanong is surrounded by 40% of Canada's petrochemical industry and is one of um, the specifically indigenous nations, but is one of um, the groups of people that is, is infected by um, environmental racism. And so what that can look like is that they put 60% of the highest admitting in the five kilometer radius. And we are very much surrounded by these refineries and facilities and they're petrochemical so they make things like um in Canada it's where they first um quote unquote like I always like put quotations around it but like discovered oil but they didn't actually like discover oil like indigenous people always knew about oil and we had ways of using it but it was more like taking it off of surface land and using it for like say like waterproofing a canoe um, but it was more like in um, oil springs, they wanted to like really bring it up from the ground and it was more of the crude oil state. And so in my areas where again, quote unquote discovered, it was actually a cow historically that like stepped in a puddle. <laughs> um, and then they made up these like really big refineries and they put them all in the area. But then when London, Ontario's um, refinery was struck by lightning, they moved it all down to my area. And they did it through shady land deals. And so um, like my community wasn't properly even consulted about what would be happening or what they were doing or even how long they're staying. Um, and this is in the like 1880s. So they've been here for like over a hundred years. Um, and they really made like this really big international like metropolis of like petrochemical industries. Um, they put pipelines under our waterways, which is something that is really big in the US right now um, that we're fighting the same company Enbridge 
um, they have line three and line five um, and they put it under our waterways like the thing that like is very very important to us is like the Great Lakes and they put them under the Great Lakes to get to Michigan they put railways underneath the waterway there which have actually a train has derailed under there but it didn't make major headlines it just very much impacted like our small communities there um, and then they put in an international bridge so that they could get truckers across the border and then they put in major pipelines like I said that go to the U.S. and then all through Canada um, and they make like so much stuff that like Canada and U.S. and like a lot of places like benefit from like synthetic rubber, um, oils, gas, things for jet fuels. But the thing that impacts really heavily is my very small community that's so close to it uh, and completely surrounded by it. And it's really like interesting to see the impacts. Like I said, they've been here from the 1880s and to see what has happened in accumulation of like thousands of chemicals because these refineries don't shut down at any point in the day um they go like all through holidays they try and admit more in the nighttime than they do in the daytime because they figure we're sleeping and it's not going to impact us as much um but literally it can make our window shake on like a really big flare that's happening in the nighttime um and it impacted our health like drastically <laughs> like um we have things like a birth ratio that's um two girls for every one boy and that is a really big impact to make on a small community. My community is only 850 people that live on reserve. Uh, and we have things like cancers. We've been studied to have uh, mercury in our hair and PCBs, which are now banned in Canada in our blood systems. And we have things like uh, genetic chemicals. Um, and it really is hard because it was almost like they put these refineries here and treated us like guinea pigs where they didn't know what would happen if they exposed this much to a small community and they found out what happened. And it is that we have gotten um, sick and that our traditional ways of life and even our whole landscape had been altered through colonization and through um, this process that they had of environmental racism where they strategically put it next to a reserve like you would not see this near Justin Trudeau's house or Doug Ford's and how heavily impacted a very small community and how it is still impacting to this day. Wow, this is this is simply shocking. And, and how would you say it has shaped your activism? It definitely shaped it a lot. Like ever since I was like a young kid, I like was always really like, and I grew curious about it because there was um, uh, there, like I was always surrounded by them, but then when my parents took me off reserve to different towns or even different reserves, and I would see that um, not everyone had a refinery like in their backyard, like that wasn't normal. Um, and then also um, like, but I did realize that when I got brought to Detroit where another like, black community was surrounded by a marathon refinery and it was like really big and really intense like mine and I could like recognize the machinery and I was like they have those things and they have those things kind of thing um and it was also like really weird for me growing up because like I honestly thought the smokestacks were cloud makers like <laughs> growing up when they're like like they're right in your viewpoint every like day and like going into school um, I thought, I honestly thought that's how clouds were made. And so <laughs> I went into like, I think it was like grade five and my teacher was teaching how clouds were actually made. <laughs> and I argued with her because I thought that those were the cloud makers. Um, and she didn't know what I was talking about because she knew us from the reserve, but she didn't know like it had that kind of impact on reserve kids or anything. Um, and so I argued with her the whole class that like, no, no, like they're made in my backyard. Um, and then it was like that kind of moment that I was like, I actually don't know what these things make. Like, what is the point of them being so close to us? And why does the air stink sometimes? And like, why is it hard to breathe sometimes? Or why have we been evacuated from our homes because there's been like a major spill? Um, and I realized that it wasn't technically normal. It was normal to me, but it wasn't normal to like a lot of like people. 
Um, and then when I got more curious about it, then I actually watched uh, my brother um, put on The Inconvenient Truth and I saw the refineries on the movie. And I was like, oh, <laughs> and then something clicked and I got even more curious about history. And like, I'd always been like a really big history buff growing up. Like I remember being infuriated in school when Stephen Harper came out with his apology for residential schools, but I was so young. Like, <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> like, that's not okay. Um, and so like, I really wanted to know my community's history and the, like the impact of oil, like on communities. And so then I got reached out to, uh, communities in the tar sand and hearing their stories I'm feeling so connected over something so hard like of like being impacted by like man camps and oil um and feeling like that was like like what our bridge of connection was but it was really hard because it was like not like incredibly positive things and then um working with communities uh like uh, that face of other environmental damages, but like communities of color, like I was like, I'm really clicking with these communities of color that also have like environmental degradation happening in Canada and the US, um, but then also working with um, communities that are fighting the pipelines, like, and that being so heartbreaking for me and going to their communities and telling them how hard it is to actually live with pipelines. Like in my community, there's one street crossing where there's 86 pipelines in the ground and I'm like like it like growing up with it it is really hard especially when they spill like one thing that they don't like really talk about with pipelines is like if they spill they don't really know how to clean it up and that has been faced in my community like quite a few times like with 86 pipelines on one ground like it's hard to clean up and it's hard to really understand the impacts of that or like how it does impact you even though it's like buried and not looked at it does impact your like upbringing um, and talking with those communities and how hard it is for those communities just to get a proper no. Like we don't want those pipelines. We don't want those man camps, but how it already happened with my community with like little to no consent um, has been really important work for me and has um, led me to really connecting with my culture and language more about how it feels important for me to reconnect with those aspects of myself too being an indigenous person, but also seeing how that heavily impacts my culture. <laughs> and like, um, cause like our deer have cancers. Like if it sucks, if you like learn all your like hunting and like really are excited to do it and you finally get your deer and it has cancer and you can't eat it. You can't do anything with it. You just have to leave it to the land. Um, and how we're told to only eat one fish a month when we used to be really big fishermen. We live on the St. Clair River where so many fish come through. We used to have really big sturgeon migrations and like all these old stories that are just stories and like landmarks of what it used to be. But now seeing how industry actually really heavily impacts the land to today or how I even talk about my land versus my grandma or my great, great grandma, like it really impacts like our lifestyles. And so it's been a really big drive in my life. And like what I think is really important to educate and how I have a unique experience and how I can actually talk about it. Whereas a lot of youth in my community have a hard time even like talking about it. And for me, it was awkward at first. Like it was like trying to tell people my morning routine of like what it's like to brush my teeth. <laughs> like I was like, it's something that like a chemical valley that I've lived with my whole life, but to be able to get it to someone to understand to the level that I do and how impacted I am to the level, like was really hard, but I'm happy that I'm able to do it. Wow. And I'd like to bring both Terrell and Deborah into the conversation. Um, can you tell me some of the issues you're working on in your own region and how it shapes your activism? You can go ahead, Terry Lynn. Yes, thank you. I, I too, I'm very happy to be here to join in the voices, uh, Indigenous women voices, Indigenous people's voices from Canada. I'm speaking today from the beautiful territory of the semi Amu Nation, uh, and I'm really grateful to live and work here when I'm not in Haida Gwaii. So as you indicated, I work for the Council of the Haida Nation, and my work really is to support their work towards recognition and implementation of Haida title and rights. And our work is driven by the needs of the island, the islands of Haida Gwaii, uh, the land and sea, 
and also the people of Haida Gwaii. So just for an example, going back to the Tree Farm License 39 case, the Haida case that you spoke about in the introduction, we told the court that from 1977 to 1999, 22 and a half million cubic meters of trees were taken from Haida Gwaii. And so one cubic meter is about the equivalent of one telephone pole. And so we told the Supreme Court that that was enough if you place them end to end to end, that those trees in that 20 year period would circumnavigate the globe not once, but 24 times. And yet, even though we had that decision that, that really clarified that the Crown can't just consult, but must accommodate, um, the Supreme Court still wrote about how trees are everywhere on Haida Gwaii, yet we've had so many trees taken. Trees and old growth cedar trees are the foundation of Haida culture. They um, form, they make our longhouses, our canoes, our totem poles, our storage boxes, and we literally exist in those cedar trees from cradle to grave. So it really has been important. As a result of that decision, um, we protected uh, over 50% of Haida Gwaii is in now in protected area status and portions of the oceans are also protected. But that really is now our focus is turning to the oceans. The oceans around Haida Gwaii are some of the richest in the world, yet several of the species that come from Haida Gwaii are already fully exploited on the BC coast. Um, you go into a restaurant in Vancouver and you'll have Haida Gwaii halibut or Haida Gwaii sablefish and the, you know the biggest the top two of the 10 fisheries come from Haida Gwaii alone. And so um, our focus now is turning to the oceans. You've probably heard of this idea of terra nullius, which led to the expansion and so-called discovery, as Gizzi was saying, of Canada. That same principle has been applied to ocean spaces. We have mare nullius, this idea that oceans are empty. We don't yet have rulings in respect of ocean spaces to say that Aboriginal title includes sea floors or lake bottoms. That's an area that Indigenous scholars are working really hard to expand here in Canada and everywhere in the world. So those are the areas that are really important as an island nation and I suspect are, suspect are important to other island nations throughout the world. Thank you very much. Now I'll let Deborah McGregor jump in. Yeah, thank you. So um, yeah, wonderful to be here and thank you for the invitation. And I don't know if it's morning or afternoon or evening, wherever folks are dialing in from, but uh, welcome. And uh, really appreciating the words of uh, BZ and, and Terry Lynn. Um, what, what I'll add to the, add to the question is, um, Although I'm in the um, academic world, I do try to try to ground what I do in the priorities of communities because I still live in mine and I'm from there. And when my career is over, that's where I'm going to go. And so it's it's still really important to me to take care of um, take care of what I can. And the current work that I'm doing in relation to climate justice, and I do frame it that way for a lot of the reasons that that BZ and, and Terry Lynn talked about. Um, and, and Victoria um, also um, introduced as well into this conversation. Um, so one of the catalysts for me was this youth elders uh, climate uh, knowledge sharing gathering that I facilitated, I guess, five or six years ago. And, um, and it was actually organized by, by youth, the Young People's Council at the Chiefs of Ontario, and they wanted to learn from elders. They wanted to learn around um, traditional knowledge around climate change. And elders were actually very also interested in learning from youth because they were learning about this in school in a different way. And, uh, and it was bringing these, um, this intergenerational, multi-generational uh, conversations, um, conversations together. And um, it's, it, it's too long to get into sort of like, there was so many aha moments there for me that was so different than what I was seeing in sort of the climate change um, narratives and that, that was occurring throughout the, the world um, and the country it was very grounded. And what the, the youth really wanted to do because of this uh, colonial legacy that both BZ and, and Terry Lynn talked about was a lot of times feeling a, a disconnect from, from the earth and being able to, to live um, on the land in the way that, um, that they wanted and know was important. So they were, their, their big priority was, was reconnecting. Um, through language, through land-based activities. Um, that's where you get your food. And 
elders were really committed and knowledge holders are really committed to um, to the same thing, but in a different way. They, they were very concerned about healing of um, Mother Earth, uh, the Earth as well, and, and the land as well. And what bound uh, these together was the importance of Indigenous knowledge in this, the importance of Indigenous languages. That was really emphasized, and you don't often hear that in climate change discussions at all. The importance of our own laws they talked about, um, and the way that we wanted to um, govern the way that we approached climate change. And because that's not the current process right now, usually Indigenous peoples are in, putting into other people's solutions. And what really became obvious to me was um, the solutions that were being presented by federal and provincial governments to the um, First Nations people who were at this um, was a disconnect to what the people were identifying as being a appropriate solutions to address the challenges that they were facing. There was a real disconnect. I remember sitting there looking at this going, there, there's, a, there's a disconnect. Other people's solutions aren't the priorities of, of Indigenous people. So, uh, so those really um, stuck, uh, stuck home with me and that's really been inspiring the work that I do. How I'm approaching it in, um, I guess, in the academic world or, or through a research project that that I'm engaged in at the moment is, um, is trying to do that, is actually supporting uh, language retention and revitalization as part of um, climate justice, trying to achieve indigenous climate justice. And so this is um, talking to elders, trying to generate the material through video multimedia, which I'm terrible at by the way, but I know that uh, it's important. Some of the feedback we got from people, probably they're not gonna read peer reviewed articles because <laughs> they don't have access. Universities pay a lot of money to have access to these. Um, so you have to think about other modes and other ways of communicating um, communicating to people and, and also really trying to support that, um, that connection to the land. And, where knowledge can actually be generated from the land itself. So right now I'm working with a couple of youth and I'm not sure what, if they're gonna come up with a, a graphic novel or a comic or something else of, um, of sort of a, our own embodied learning of what's happening. So what are we observing? And we're using um, an Anishinaabek um, conceptual model of the 13 moons. So every 13 moon, what is it that we're noticing and experiencing? How is that different from the stories of what our ancestors said? Because um, a lot of the times we're told as Indigenous people, well, we don't have the baseline. We actually can't measure change. And I'm like, well, actually we do. We have ways of knowing that. And for Anishinaabek, one of the ways was through 13 moon. We know exactly what's supposed to happen in each one of the moons. And if that's not happening, um, then we've got a problem. <laughs> and so, so it's a very embodied learning and trying to get um, youth engagement in that because they, they can then start that work of um, assessing what's happening as opposed to relying on other frameworks that are very siloed that are, um, I'll talk about uh, talk about later. So what this has enabled me to do is when I'm in these other spaces that the privilege of being in the academy provides me with, I try to advocate for that. And it is a challenge. People don't want to hear about colonialism and climate change, exactly what Terry Lynn and BZ talked about. They don't want to hear about uh, Aboriginal and treaty rights or treaties and how is that remotely relevant to um, climate justice. So I find myself in these spaces talking about um, these topics and subjects that aren't in the radar of, of people who are who are working around um, uh, you know climate change and trying to do trying to develop solutions. So um, so I'll I'll stop there because I do think um, it is important to for me to to really ground um, what I'm doing and the priorities of communities um, that I'm working with and that forms the basis of of then what I do. So I know that. Um, you know, that I'm always, um, that I'm always trying to, I believe in the work that I do, try to um, help future generations um, and the planet and the work I'm doing. And, and it's informed by um, a lot of people that I work with in communities. So Chimigwech for this opportunity to share some of that. Well, thank you again for the three of me, uh, being here and the aspect of communication, how do we negotiate that in an unequal space brings me to this term that we're advancing in this webinar, climate diplomacy. It's a term that's not really used in Canada uh, from when I studied in Canada. It's definitely not a term that we would use to describe domestic discussions or uh, international discussions around climate change. In what way, how do you understand this concept? And this question is to the three of you. How do you understand this concept? And do you find it relevant in a Canadian context or 
could could it have a, a, a place in, in that space? Well, maybe I'll jump in here to, I'll, I'll turn to a narrative from the Haida Nation about Kuya Gagandals. And this is a narrative that comes from the beginning of time. In our worldview, Haida Gwaii is a, play, is a supernatural world with supernatural beings that took pity on us so that we would learn how to live in this present realm. And in this narrative, all of the supernatural beings hold a contest for who will hold up Haida Gwaii. And eventually, Stone, eventually, Kuya Gagandals wins that contest to hold up Haida Gwaii. So, in our conception of the world, Haida Gwaii is this island that floats on the ocean realm. And Kuya Gagandals has a pole that balances Haida Gwaii, and that pole is resting on his chest. And so, turning to language, which, as you mentioned, Deborah, is really important, the Haida word for responsibility is Lagu Gakantlins, and it means literally you on it, chest leaning on. So responsibilities are things that you feel in your heart and in your chest. So climate diplomacy to me would mean, what actions am I committing to doing for the best interests of holding up the earth, literally drawing upon the Haida worldview. So first and foremost, that is our consideration of what steps we will take. So this requires a paradigm shift from imposing obligations to accepting responsibilities. Responsibilities is a new um, term that is also making its way into the climate change discourse, but is not there fully enough. Responsibility, re reciprocity, and careful balance with the natural world are foundational and are treasured values and laws of Indigenous peoples. So for an example, in Haida Gwaii, we don't have rights to our land, to our oceans, to the beings around us, to our crest, to our names, but rather we have privileges that may be taken away if we do not meet our responsibilities to the earth, to the oceans, to each other, or to the natural world. So again, I see um, climate diplomacy as recognizing the responsibilities that each of us have to change the course of our history for future generations. Thank you. What I'll, what I'll add to that, I just love that, Terry Lynn, to, to start off with um, with our own stories um, and frameworks and, and, I, and just to build on that. So I think an Indigenous climate diplomacy, for lack of a better term or concept, I don't even know if there's such a thing, um, is, is it goes beyond the human dimension. It includes other entities and other beings as being part of that conversation and part of that story. Whereas, um, my impression of, of climate diplomacy is it's generally nation states, people negotiating, and it's generally people rather than bringing in the, um, you know, entities and from other um, from other realms that would be that would be known to people. Um, and I I think as leading up to COP twenty six, and and I was listening, it's such big news right now. Um, how the, the Prime Minister in Canada is going to visit other nations in preparation for COP26. So they're engaging in this kind of diplomacy, but, uh, but no one's really talking about it that way. Like that's not front page news. Oh, Prime Minister in climate diplomacy, that's not what you're seeing. Um, but that didn't really happen with Indigenous people. So Indigenous peoples aren't recognized as being societies and nations. We're not, we're not part of that diplomatic conversation, even if we might have them with each other through our own treaties with each other's, our own agreements with each other's. So, so when you're excluded in that way as people, and then all, everything else that we consider to be important that should be part of that conversation, then you're on the outside looking in. Um, and then surprise, you know, um, at COP26, Indigenous peoples find themselves in a position of advocacy and activism because you're not included as part of that conversation as being a nation or recognized as a complete society um, that has everything every other um, society would have. So that's kind of how I see it, um, kind of see it playing out. And what it means on the ground is that Indigenous nations then lack that kind of support to be able to develop their own processes and strategies to, to govern and self-determine their own future in, in the light of climate change. So um, that's what I would, I would add to the conversation. This is sort of based on 
how I'm watching this all kind of play out right now. Um, and then, you know, listening to the words of BZ and Terry Lynn about this is how people are experiencing this on the ground and we have our own stories for explaining how we're going to be in the world and actually what we're seeing. Our stories actually diagnose what's happening and, and what we need to do to move toward um, a different future. Thank you. I think it's like interesting what we look at what Indigenous people are doing to our, like, our um, territories, like we um, lost control through colonization of like actually having a voice and like what happens to our home territories and like what's going on. Like we're not a part of like in my territory for talking about regulations or anything. It's people outside of our community saying it's okay to release benzene in your community um, and not facing any of those impacts. Benzene is actually something that a human isn't also to be exposed to, but it's exposed to in my community because part of their production, uh, the oil industry. Um, and I'm like, and it's so interesting how when Indigenous people had their own agency and um, did like their way of life, but like it didn't impact the climate as much where our ways of life and our ways um, like like working with the land, um, not just living off of it, but also holding such high honor and like under that what we're doing now impacts the future. When we had that agency before colonization, um, like the things that we have now compared to what we did, like our clothing, like would be from our like from like a moose or deer thing or like more textiles um, versus now where it's like they're more oil based like this shirt's oil based <laughs> um but then also like like from then and then now the big industry boom and how it affected the climate but now what in, like what indigenous people are doing now is like their way of healing is going back to their cult going back to communities to reconnect and our ways of life that it used to be, but it's healing us from traumas that happened from colonization and reconnecting us to our land in a different way because it was altered and changed through colonization where I'm like, deer aren't as plentiful like in my area. Um, honestly, before Chemical Valley was there and before the deforestation, it used to be really swampy and we had moose. Now I'm like, I live up in the area because I um, I fell in love with like a Métis person that lives more in the Georgian Bay region. And so I'm living in their area um, and the moose are getting pushed up even further. And I'm like, but so long ago, they used to live down in my area. And it's such a change of landscape that like it is a way of reconnecting, but it has so altered and shifted to what it looks like to like um, Deborah is like really connecting so eloquently. Um, um, like it's such a big impact but like and then yeah still having little to no agency on what's happening on our territories which I think is critically important in this time that like direct action should be like that indigenous people have a say in what's going on in their own territories like more so And I have so many questions I, I want to ask, but I want to be mindful of the time. And so I, and I want to pivot the conversation towards integrating Haida and Anishinaabe knowledge, laws, and perspectives in climate negotiation. The first question would be to Tara Lynn. Your work as a, you work as a legal counselor to the Haida Nation, you're a scholar, you're an artist, and you shed light on Haida culture, law, and management practices. And from forest to oceans governance, what have been some of the challenges in implementing and having Haida law and management practices recognized uh, in Canada? Sure, before I address that, I just wanna speak about some of the joys because I think it's important to talk about that as well and the successes. And one of the greatest things that we've been able to achieve is having Haida laws in management plans for the management of the Guayanas area, which is 25% of the terrestrial area of Haida Gwaii. And those have been, those Haida laws, foundational Haida laws have been recognized by both the provincial and federal government as guiding management of that area. Of course, it's easier to protect, to manage protected areas compared to development areas, but still that is a great joy and success. As well, having that now for 30 years, that management with the government of Canada, 
it brings me great joy to see youth getting out on the land in cultural camps for the last 30 years and also gaining work experience. So I see some of my younger cousins, their job is, is getting on a boat and going down into the Guayanas area. And that isn't something that was available to me as a young person. So I think that's really important. The challenges are that management plan took 30 years to negotiate. So from 1988 to 2018. So a decision was made to protect the area, but then the hard work was what, how will we manage that area? And what are the laws that will go, that will guide the management of that area? So even great successes still take time to bear fruit. Um, I think it's great that HIDA laws and ethics are included in those management plans, but the greatest challenges are state recognition, as I mentioned earlier, that Aboriginal title includes ocean spaces and the marine species that are through it, because oceans are much more difficult than managing land. Species move in and out of areas, and there's a whole different legal regime that applies to ocean spaces. It is very hard to restrain commercial activities, much like what we've heard about from the other speakers. Um, outside of the protected areas, so continuing, we still have challenges with, with restraining commercial logging outside of the protected areas. Of course, those areas outside of the protected areas are the heartland and the main commercial um, viable, viable forest that we need to uh, keep an eye on. Um, it's very hard to restrain commercial fishing of threatened stocks such as herring, which requires litigation to protect, even when there are solid evidence that DFO scientists say that there shouldn't be a fishery opening, we still then have to go to court to stop that fishing from, that, uh, fishing from opening. Nationally, um, Canada's highest court held that climate change is the threat of the highest order to the country and indeed the world, and also recognized the serious effect of climate change on Indigenous peoples to, to sustain themselves and maintain their traditional ways of life. Yet, <laughs> oil and gas natural pipelines continue to be approved through Indigenous peoples' territories without free prior and informed consent. And yet, when Indigenous peoples intervened in an environmental reference case from the province of BC to the Supreme Court of Canada, where we said that we need to recognize that there is pluralism, that Indigenous peoples have jurisdiction that really is part of Canada's constitution and needs to, to live with the other forms of jurisdiction, uh, it was dismissed without even written reasons in January of 2020. So um, we really need to, uh, um, the word for law in the Haida language is kil yata, and it means speaking with respect. And often the, what we hear and what we see on the ground are so very different that this concept of kil yata is not integrating. So we hear things that are being said at COP and yet very different circumstances on the land. So we really need to find a way to bridge that divide. Thank you. And I would want to ask Deborah, um, how can Indigenous knowledge, more specifically Anishinaabe knowledge, help us around climate change questions? We, we have a global audience joining us now that, that might be asking that question. And so I, I'd like to hear uh, from you. Yeah, there's so so much to say about that. But just to build a little bit on, on what BZ and Terry Lynn said is this, um, to support really for for indigenous peoples to reconnect or beyond the land like Terry Lynn talked about and the work that the, the work that BZ does um, because if that doesn't continue so there's this real narrative around okay we got to protect indigenous knowledge it's important but totally forget about the people like actually no the people have to be able to do to do their to do their thing on the land in order that's where the knowledge is generated and talked about and in language and um, and, and everything else uh, to, for a sustainable livelihood or, or to live responsibly and well with, with the rest of creation and, and natural world, however, however that's being constructed in, in different nations. So what I, what I remind, um, I guess, people of, and, and is that Indigenous peoples are complete societies, just like everyone else's. But that, that's what was here prior to colonization and still is, but that, that's most of Anishinaabe people's history. Our history is we were societies and nations and we interacted with other nations and, and had treaties and engaged in lawmaking and diplomacy actually. And, and sometimes that gets forgotten. We just become populations 
And, um, and so that means we had our own laws, as Terry Lynn pointed out, we had our own knowledge systems, we had our own ways of being in the world. Um, and that isn't really recognized in a lot of um, Indigenous knowledge conversations like globally in relation to uh, relation to climate change. But here's what we know. We know that um, Indigenous peoples around 20%, like the, the numbers change a little bit, um, <laughs> depending on, on your source, but this is something I'm paying a lot of attention to is, so Indigenous nations caretake about 20% of, of the world's Black better word resources. I don't like to use that word all the time. Uh, and uh, but that's maintaining 80% of the world's biodiversity. Um, so indigenous peoples knowledge laws and governance tells you something about appropriate caretaking, responsible caretaking, responsible relationships um, with the earth. And adding to that is that that's where indigenous languages are mostly spoken. So there's something about indigenous knowledge and languages that enables this intact ecosystems and biodiversity. So there's something to learn from indigenous peoples um, and, and our knowledge systems. And our knowledge systems, again, were part of the system. So this process of often wanting to extract from indigenous people and stick it into other frameworks, that's a real compulsion, it's a big problem, <laughs> um, is often unethical and inappropriate because then it gets used in a different context as opposed to the one that, that, um, that it supports. And so, um, so often, so I want to kind of point out this tension that, that Terry Lynn and also Beezy um, hinted at is there's this, I'm sort of, I don't exactly know what to call it, but it's something that I'm really noticing in a lot of um, so some of what I'm seeing in Canada's public policy, what sometimes gets said internationally when I'm reading the United Nations reports is this indigenous peoples are the most um, impacted and most vulnerable to climate change. And that's true, absolutely. Um, people are feeling it literally on the ground. It's not abstract. It's not conceptual. Um, and then, and then, in the next line, often says, and then Indigenous peoples also have knowledge that can contribute to these solutions. And so there's this real tension that exists because Indigenous peoples need to need to have their laws and governance and everything else recognized and to to build that kind of support. Um, however, that happened. And as Vizi pointed out, um, like almost like one of an Indigenous climate solution is those culture and land-based activities. Because that's um, that story that Terry Lynn called, that the story she told, that beautiful story, that's where our knowledge comes from. And that that's what's going to help and inform, um, I think, these big questions that we have. So Indigenous peoples actually have to be supported. But I find there's a real split, a dualism. OK, we want Indigenous knowledge, and but you know we don't not, not necessarily want to protect people. But you have to. And, and what's important to Indigenous peoples in order for that knowledge to be able to, um, to contribute. Because I do think um, it can, because we've had to survive. We've all had to, we've had to survive. We've gone through dramatic environmental change. And here we are, including genocidal policies that's outlined in Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Murdered, Missing and Indigenous Women's um, Inquiry. So we do, we do have something, um, something to contribute. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Hopefully that's a bit of food for thought, um, but I, I definitely do feel that Indigenous peoples, our knowledge and our laws um, and our governance and, and way of life has something really important to contribute to these broader um, conversations if we're, able, if we're able to be part of them in a meaningful way. So um, thank you. And thank you to BZ and Terry Lynn for, for inspiring some of my thinking in response to that question as well. And so this is this is kind of my next question. I want to open the floor to both BZ and Terilyn. Is exactly what do you think the roles and responsibilities are for non-Indigenous people to engage in engaging with Indigenous laws and knowledge? I spoke last, BZ. How about you jumping in? Um. <clears throat> I always have like a tricky like way of like kind of answering questions when like people are asking for calls to action because I'm like everyone has different capacities different privileges and so it can be hard for like like to like really single something out as like like an action thing I think there's so many different things and it's so inspiring to hear uh, Terry Lynn talk about your community and like all this like like work that 30 years of work that you did but to get what you have is like incredible and 
like hearing like those like amazing stories from communities where um, having more governance and say in their community, I think is so vital and I think needs to happen for more communities. Um, and I listening to Deborah talk about, um, I didn't know the statistics whatsoever, but like that is really like incredible to hear um, like the indigenous people like that ties up their saying, but I'm like, but I also think like validating indigenous people in the ways that they're trying to um, and not looking at it in such a colonial sense of how and what we how we want to govern or our laws are just as valid if they're not constitutions or different things like um when we talk about like uh unceded territory like that's not like it's still being i still feels like it's such like a like fight to be recognized for some places um and then um the places that um are seated and like um all these different things that feel so restricting to first nations but like not having a proper seat at the table or not seeing indigenous knowledge holders like elders um feeling valid enough without um things like higher education um like not even sometimes I've seen like elders not even be able to be brought into a school as a teacher because they haven't had a teaching degree and it feeling like inaccessible for people who don't have those kind of um like higher statuses but are just as valid with like um like our elders are just as valid to help our communities with um talking about laws and bringing up our old ways and um our teachings um, should be held just as valuable. Um, and I think, uh, like, I think our own citizens need to do, like, um, like Canada's own citizens need to do work. I don't know so much what it, to do for, like, to tell them to do, but to let Indigenous people start doing their thing and having their elders be valuable, even though they don't have um, these university teaching degrees, but still be part of, like, these decision makings and bringing them in and youth like we used to Anishinaabe people used to have youth councils elders councils women's councils um to help make these like bigger decisions and to have governance over our own people whatever that may like be like it's definitely not in the same way that governments is today but like in our own communities ways and be seen as valid and not be looked at in such a colonial sense and think that's not valid Yeah, I feel like we're speaking on the winds of change and each one of us is supporting the other to uh, advance our thinking. So thank you very much for that. I would just quickly say that, that um, settlers and others need to create space for the resurgence of Indigenous legal orders and then hold that space. And this is not space.